Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's special members webinar. My name is Serena, and joining us today is the Eclipse Foundation Executive Director, Mike Milinkovic, who will be presenting our talk on the European Cyber Resiliency Act for today. If you have any questions for Mike as we move through today's presentation, feel free to ask them in the chat or use the Ask a Questions tab. Without any further delay, Mike, over to you. Thanks, Serena. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, and yeah, so uh, just so you know, I'm staring at my slides. I can't really see what's going on in the chat, but I will loop back afterwards. Um, so we will have some t lots of time for questions at the end. Uh, there's a lot of dense slides here, and I apologize for that in advance. Uh, partially because I wanted to give people a copy of the slides that they and I, I put the where you can download the slides um, in the chat, um, give people access to the slides uh, as a reference later. Um, but first, I, I should say thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Um, I think this is a, a first for the Eclipse Foundation uh, to have a special members meeting like this. Um, and we're really pleased with uh, how many people have joined us. Um, and so thank you so much uh, for taking the time today. So um, without further ado, let's launch into uh, the European Cyber uh, Resilience Act and how that might impact us at the Eclipse Foundation and to a certain degree, how we think it might impact uh, the open source community and ecosystem um, around the world. So first, just a really quick reminder of, of, of why we're here. Um, so uh, the Eclipse Foundation is uh, the largest open source foundation in Europe with over 410 projects, 350 members, um, 1,800 committers, and uh, about two thirds of to 70% of our projects and our committer population are based in Europe, which was part of the reason why we moved to Europe um, four years ago. Um, we're up to 60 staff members and with 18 different working groups, including a number of um, important European initiatives like Eclipse Software Defined Vehicle. And what do we do at the Eclipse Foundation? Uh, so just as a really quick reminder, um, we are a governance layer uh, that provides collaboration uh, capabilities to people, companies, universities, research organizations, you know, all the stakeholders that are interested in doing open source um, to come together and to collaborate on, on open source um, technology, which then uh, you know, outside of the Eclipse Foundation um, can typically or often uh, be monetized in some kind of commercial product or service. Uh, we conservatively estimate that we've got around $20 billion um, of shared investments um, over our 19-year lifespan. And uh, of course, we're very, um, very pleased with the support that we've gotten from our community and our members um, and all the, all the smart and hardworking people that have been on our projects for so many years. So why are we here today? Um, so the European Commission has proposed a new legislation intended to improve the state of cybersecurity and software uh, hardware products made available in Europe. And, and I really, it's really important to stress that um, this legislation was written with you know, the best of intentions. And you know, of course, you know, we're here because we see some issues with the legislation. Uh, but we are, you know, we are confident that uh, that with goodwill we can work through these issues, and that we think that there's um there there are some opportunities to improve things, but we don't think that you know this was done with the best of intentions, and ultimately this is about improving the security um, for products that are sold in Europe, and uh, you know for all of us um, as you know citizens and consumers that's a good thing, and so I don't think we should take our eye off the. The fact that there are there are really good reasons why this legislation is taking place, um, but where we are in the process is also important to understand. So, this legislation has been drafted by the European Commission and has now been passed off to the European Parliament um, and the and the Council of Europe. And so, those are these are the two bodies where amendments can be made. But we are now in sort of a, the the political process. Uh, where to have amendments made, we need to um, persuade uh, you know, politicians, whether they be members of European Parliament or representative of a, of a nation state, uh, a member state in, in the council. So what does the Cyber Resilience Act actually do? So as I mentioned, the goal is to improve the security um, of all products with digital elements made available in Europe. And we'll, we'll in a slide, next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Uh, what is the scope of that definition? 
And it requires all manufacturers take security into account across both their development processes and the life cycle of their products once they're shipped. So it's you, it's mandating a set of, of best practices for making sure that your products are secure by design as you build them. And then also making sure that they are maintained properly once they're put into the marketplace. Um, and then there's also a notion of applying the, the CE mark um, to their to products to indicate the conformance with requirements of the CRA. Um, the CE mark is a, uh, you know, you've, if you've bought an, a radio um, or an electronic device, um, there's a really good chance that if you look on the back or underneath it somewhere, there's a CE mark um, where the uh, where the manufacturer has attested that they have built that device in conformance with European standards and regulations. Okay, so so what is the scope of the CRA? Um, so we're talking about this applies to all software, whether embedded in cyber physical systems, um, you know, it, consumer IR or industrial IoT devices or the like, packaged software or software as a service. Um, and so there, they, this is very, very, very broad. This is basically um, applying to all software and it's applied to software um, that is making that is made available in Europe. Um, and of course, in today's internet world, made available um, can be interpreted to be very, very broad. Um, you know, most software today is downloaded over the internet. Um, and so there's really, uh, you know, made available in Europe is it could be, could, and, and I think should be interpreted in a very broad way. So the kinds of process requirements that it's mandating um, for manufacturers of, of products and the word, the term manufacturer is a defined term um, and it applies to you know, anybody who is making a cyber physical system, package software or providing software as a service. And it's also, then there's another term around a uh, distributor that is you know, somebody who's making something available in Europe. Um, and so it requires that uh, the, the use of software bill of materials, that they, they're, they're be made uh, security patches be available, that there's a call home functionality so that users can be notified that a package is, uh, requires an update and requires support of products for no less than five years. So once something has been released into the European single market, um, you, you, the manufacturer, uh, need to maintain that product with security patches and the like for, for, um, for at least five years. Um, there's also provisions in there that re uh, restrict the publication of unfinished software for testing purposes. So if you have a work in progress software that you want um, people to test, um, there's provisions in there that can only be made available for a limited time and it has to be marked as not for commercial use and the, and, and the like. Um, and um, for those of you who are involved in in building Eclipse Foundation projects, you'll immediately notice that that doesn't, um, you know, that that's runs quite counter to how we build software in an open and transparent way. And there's a lot of process and documentation required on a per release basis. Now, on the CE mark, um, there are three types of uh, product types. Um, so again, products with digital elements. Basically, that's all software, whether it's in, whether it's included in cyber physical systems, package software, or, or software as a service. And then there's three tiers within that definition of, of, um, of uh, product with digital elements. The first one, product with digital elements, then critical projects with digital elements, and highly critical projects, um, products with, with digital elements. And um, the critical and highly critical systems must use external audits um, for getting your CE certification. The first, which of course is the far broader one, you can actually rely upon a self-assessment um, for doing the CE mark. Um, and just to be clear, we, we believe at the Eclipse Foundation, we have a number of projects um, that would fall into the definition of critical or highly critical. Um, I'm thinking projects like Oniro, um, Eclipse Lida, um, perhaps Eclipse 4 Diac, um, and others um, that that are because they define highly critical systems as as typically as operating systems that are intended for use in in uh, industrial applications or IoT applications, um, things which are doing SCADA controllers and the like. Um, and so we we do feel that uh, expect that we have. Prod, uh, projects hosted at the Eclipse Foundation that fall into these categories.
Now, the legislation does have a, a laudable uh, attempt to carve out open source, um, but um, we and, and others, uh, there's going to be a slide at the end with some links that you can find of where others have written about this topic as well. But it's um, there's a carve out for open source um, that that references, you know, open source developed or supplied outside of the course of a commercial activity. The problem is, is when you dig into the supporting legislative framework um, that, uh, that that underpins the CRA, the definition of commercial activity uh, that you'll find in the in the European Blue Guide on, on product rules um, says that um, nonprofit organizations may be considered as carrying out commercial activities if they operate in a business related context. Um, so in, in, on a case by case basis, the things that they look at is the characteristics of the products, uh, the intentions of the suppliers, um, in, you know, and uh, frequency of supply and, and the like. Um, and you'll notice, you know, again, for people that are familiar with uh, the way that we do things at the Clips Foundation, um, and a number of those things um, do seem problematic. Um, so you know, our concerns about this legislation are based on our interpretation, of course, and where we are in terms of the interpretation uh, is that we think that based on the way that we're reading this, and we've talked with a lot of other people um, as well, uh, you know, this is not just us, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a large group of people that are discussing this on a regular basis. Um, our concern is that any Eclipse Foundation project uh, that's made available to the public as a downloadable, installable, and executable binary would be considered a product with digital elements made available in Europe. Um, and then, so as a general rule, you know, um, projects that that make themselves available in this way, which is frankly most the you know the vast majority of our of our projects, um, would be um, would be impacted by this. And that we think that the Eclipse Foundation meets the definition of a manufacturer um, uh, and a distributor um, under the legislation. The manufacturer, because we claim the trademarks, um, uh, ownership of the trademarks of our projects, and um, you know, and publish them under uh, a name that we we consider that we control, that we control the process by which they're published. Um, and then a direct, and then the distributor, because we host infrastructure like GitLab. Um, and artifact repositories like Marketplace and, and OpenVSX. So there's, um, so we think that we would fall under the, that those definitions um, as it's currently worded. And and part of this, of course, is this this caveat of course of commercial activity. When you look at what we do at the Cliff Foundation, uh, you know, we we seem to tick all of the boxes in terms of, of what they look at in terms of determining whether something is happening under commercial activity. We are not a charity. We, you know, the Clips Foundation projects are commonly developed by employees of members or by people who are making a living doing uh, bug fixes and so on on the projects. We do provide goods in a business related context. By that, I mean, like when people download open source from Clips, they're either going to use it in, in a business context, like Clips IDE for building Java applications or COC++ applications for um, for uh, for their employer, or downloading a product uh, or project where they're going to embed it in a uh, in in their product. We always uh, uh, provide a regular re regularity of supply. You know, an extreme example. Uh, you know, the Eclipse IDE has not missed a release date in what 16, 17, 18 years now. Um, so that's definitely you know that would definitely. And, you know, meet the definition, any definition of regularity of supply that, that I would imagine. And we, let's face it, we deliver high quality software. Um, and we, you know, we take great pride that the software that we deliver is um, found in, you know, is is equivalent to the quality found in commercial products and in, in fact goes into many commercial products. So fundamentally, to comply with this legislation, we're going to have to do a lot of work. Um, and I think it's important to mention um, that relative to a lot of other organizations out there, the Eclipse Foundation is probably in pretty good place and pretty good, in pretty good shape. I mean, we have staff, we have processes that our projects follow. You know, we can see a path where for a lot of this stuff, we could, you know, we can implement these, uh, these policies, these procedures, but it's going to be a lot of work. Um, and so 
and a lot and a lot of the work requires i think stems from the fact that the cra steps uh puts forward requirements that you need to do on a per product release basis and of course we have a lot of projects that ship um, very very regularly um, certainly a couple of times a year, the Eclipse IDE has gone to like a rolling release um, model some years ago where they're shipping four times a year. Um, and so for each one of these releases, um, we have to do uh, security risk analysis um, provide, and, and we also have to do user documentation, product technical requirements um, and, and figure out what the dependencies we have and so on and so forth. And we'll also have to do an analysis um, across our project portfolio to, to figure out which def which projects meet these various definitions. <clears throat> and in the cases of critical and highly critical, we're going to have to engage with external auditors um, on a per release basis to make sure that um, the ex that a external auditor will validate that the um, the pro correct processes have been followed in the development of that um, of that project. Um, so it, it's, you know, ultimately, this is a lot of work. We, I don't know the exact number, but conservatively, we estimate that across our 410, 420 projects, uh, we make several hundred releases a year. Um, and so um, that's, that's going to be a, a pretty significant amount of effort in order to support all of this. Now, I'm not going to go through this um, in, in great detail. Um, this is sort of for your uh, later reading pleasure, if you wish. Um, but the point here is that there are prescriptive terms in the CRA um, that, that we will have to comply with. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we do have a vulnerability um, handling policy already. Um, and, you know, we so it's, a lot of that stuff is in pretty good shape. Um, but doing risk analysis on a, on a on a per project basis and documenting that work and so on is something that we haven't typically done. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of effort to revise our development processes to ensure compliance um, and then make sure that we're doing the adequate documentation um, and um, on a per release basis for each for each one of our projects. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, a key key part of this is um, the CE mark for software products, and you can I think you need uh, to interpret these provisions in the CRA in conjunction with some additional um, revisions that are being done to another document called the Product Liability Directive, which is uh, a, quite an old uh, uh, piece of legislation that's been active in Europe I think all the way back to the 1980s, which is being updated to apply to modern software. Um, and so it's the coupling of these two things together um, that has us concerned that the combination of these two pieces of legislation um, are going to imply uh, liability requirements um, to open source code provided under open source licenses where the social contract for many years has been that, uh, you know, we're providing you code for free, including binary code. And, and, and with, you know, sometimes, you know, almost things that look like end user products, whether you're talking, you know, GIMP, LibreOffice, the Eclipse IDE, you know, things that you download, install and run on your desktop that are that provide a good user experience um, and, you know, delivers real, real value the you know but we're giving that to you for free under licenses that will permit you to modify and further distribute that um but now there could be liability obligations that are being put, imposed on this um ecosystem that ha have up to now been relying on this notion that if we give you the code for free you know we're not accepting any liability or warranty um if if there's um a problem with the software and the way that you use it So we are concerned that there could be some unintended consequences um, from the, the proposed liability regime. Um, so keep in mind that uh, open source software is developed around the world and it's um, 
always pretty much made available over the internet. So made available in Europe can arguably apply to pretty much everything um, that's being done in the open source ecosystem. Um, and again, it's being freely provided. <coughs> and it's so they I mean it's what and what I mean by that is provided as free as in free beer. Um, so there's no money exchanging hands for the use of this of this product or, um, or project and uh, free as in freedom. Um, you know, everybody who downloads the software, if they have the technical competence, can dig in and modify and repair um, change and, and further distribute the software. So there's, um, you know, free software is um, fundamentally around the ability to, to do these things. And, but it's always being provided, um, freely provided. And so one of the, I think one of the things that, that needs to be kept in mind here is that typically the way, you know, product regulations work is, you know, in, in Europe, and, and this is everywhere around the world, when you impose a, a regulation, anybody who wants access to your market has to um, conform to that regulation, or they or they can't access your market. And the motivation for companies, of course, is, well, it's a market, we're going to make money there, if we can figure out how to do this in a cost effective basis, it still makes sense for us to conform with the regulations and put the product into the market. But in the case of open source, all of these assets are being provided for free um, so that dynamic doesn't work anymore. Um, so there's no economic incentive um, for the organizations, people, distributors um, of free software um, to accept these regulations, which means that, you know, potential unintended consequences um, could go, you know, could be pretty, pretty broad could be pretty broad. Um, it could be that the uh, a rational and reasonable reaction to exposure to unexpected liability would be to say, you can't use this code in Europe. Um, and uh, there are, you know, there are some pieces of open source technology, you know, think, you know, Linux, Kubernetes, OpenStack, uh, Apache, um, where, you know, not being able to access that code in Europe would not be good for the uh, the economy of Europe. Um, it could also put European producers of open source, uh, the Eclipse Foundation included, uh, at a significant disadvantage relative to their to the peers in the industry, um, because you know there's going to be added added work in order to do this these releases, um, and there could be uh, you know a certain amount of chill related to participating in open source. In Europe, if if there is if people understand that there's this liability obligation, um, and so one of the concerns is that um, for distributors of package software, think Maven Central, think uh, NPM, think PyPy, think you know Eclipse Marketplace, um, there are liability obligations that are attached to distribution, and if open source software is not you know, clearly carved out from that, um, you know, discontinuing access to um, to these kinds of shared package software repositories um, would again be a reason reasonable and, and rational reaction to um, to an unexpected imposition of liability obligations. Um, and finally, it, there's there's a chance, um, and I've had a few conversations with with folks that that think this is this is real, is that. Um, this could this could provide a real chill um, for European companies uh, that are contributing to open source projects today, because again, if there's a, a liability obligation based on their contributions that they have not factored into the into the business equation of contributing and collaborating in open source, that could be a real problem for them. And I think it's worthwhile pointing out that there's quite a few European wide strategies that are based on open source. Uh, particularly the ones that are related to digital sovereignty. Think, you know, Gaia X, Katina X, the data spaces, digital twins, industry 4.0. You know, all of these uh, have open source front and center in, in their strategy. Um, so it's really interesting that to, to think about how um, these might be impacted if, if European businesses feel that there's uh, they have concerns with contributing to open source and collaborating through open source. 
<clears throat> so just kind of summarize in, in terms of not just impact on the Eclipse Foundation, but a potential impact on the open source ecosystem as a whole. I apologize for how dense this slide is, um, but we'll work our way through it. And so, so first off, this commercial setting um, uh, wording is problematic for open source because it is the consensus view of most of the people I talk to in the broader open source community that most open source, a great deal of open source is done in what seems to be the definition of commercial setting. Um, so that's a real issue. Um, so there's, um, and then there's another concern that's more sort of legalistic is that um, recitals in European laws are um, less, um, explicitly part of the law than articles um so there's uh th definitely an interest in in having this a, a, an exclusion for open source be included both in the recitals and in the articles um and so second point you know we think most open source foundations meet the definition of manufacturer um so we would be forced to comply um and it's important to remember that we don't have the resources to do the compliance. Uh, so if, if you're a for-profit company with a business, you know, uh, regulation, regulatory compliance is part of your business model. It makes sense. If, you know, if all else fails, you can increase the price that you charge consumers um, to pay for the regulatory compliance where we're giving uh, what we do away for free. Um, we don't have that luxury. And so, the imposition of the requirements on organizations on a nonprofit setting like the Eclipse Foundation, but I, I include all of our peers in the open source ecosystem in this, um, it's 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 imposing a process burden on organizations that have that are um, ill suited for actually implementing the, the requirements. Um, as I mentioned before, many organizations that we that are central to the um, open source ecosystem like Maven Central, NPM, and so on, um, would be deemed distributors and, again, would potentially have liability implications. And then there's just this general notion that being seen to fracture the social contract, which has underpinned open source and free software since its beginning, around the notion that, you know, we're giving you this for free um, and, you you know, you uh, but we, we don't accept any liability or warranty. I mean, I should I should mention, and to be clear, I do realize that that is that is not absolute. Um, that there is always under um, under European laws that there's some possibility of of um, liability because you cannot under European law, you know, completely disavow liability. In fact, I mean, it's, it's there's no jurisdiction in the world where you can completely disavow liability through a license or a contract. There's always going to be some statutory obligations, but the perceived risk um, is relatively low because it usually extends to, you know, actual physical damage or the like. Um, and, but this is, this is the colleagues that I've spoken to, the perception is, is that this is dramatically increasing the liability risk profile of distributing um, and participating in open source. And as I said before, this is going to be a burden on open source developers and projects, communities, foundations. Um, it's a lot of work to comply with, um, and uh, that work is going to have to be um, is going to have to be done by somebody. All right, so I guess yeah, it's uh, enough complaining. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how we think this thing could be improved, and of course. You'd be not. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that we think that the number one thing that needs to be done is a clear exclusion of open source in the legislation, um, both in recitals and articles. And I think that what makes sense is to is to move the regulatory compliance obligations clearly onto the parties that are making the money. Um, so as we all know, you know, open source is typically um monetized in many ways um and there's lots of different monetization strategies everything from offering services to putting in its software as a service to selling packaged software including it in cyber physical systems there's tons of different ways that the open source uh, the open source code is monetized uh but it, it is not monetized directly by the projects communities and foundations that support it 
um, and we need to make it clearly the obligation of those who are making the money um, need to figure out how to do this. And so, and I think we also need to have um, a clear exclusion from product liability um, for software that's freely provided. And by freely provided, I mean not in a monetized product uh, under open source licenses, which permit further modification and distribution from product liability. Um, then I think there's a few other smaller things after that. I mean, that's the big one. Um, you know, we're concerned about the, you know, any wording that prevents publication of interim development work, uh, we think is actually runs counter to what we consider to be best practices for development of open source code. So we'd like to get that fixed. Um, there is some, um, there, there is some wording, particularly in the PLD that, that, that talks about, um, liability related to software developed as a component. Um, again, we think the components that are provided under open source licenses um, should not be incurring liability. Um, I think that would be a real chill on the use of open source. And let's remember that depending on which study you're reading, between 70 and 90% of all software products these days are based on open source componentry. Um, and so that would be a real chill on the uh, on the supply chain of open source. Um, I think that there's uh, some concern around this notion that once something has been released, you need to support it in the marketplace for five years. You know, as we all know, open source projects live and die. And there has to be a way to say that, you know, this project is dead um, and put in, you know, it's been archived. It's no longer active. And, you know, you know, some kind of notice that we're pulling the. Uh, the, the distribution from, from the marketplace um, rather than continue to try to support something which has no project team um, supporting it. <clears throat> and we think also that clear, clarity that distribution of open source packages does not include liability, um, I think is really important because the last thing that any of us needs is um, a chill on the distribution um, that uh, of packages through places like PyPy, Maven Central, NPM, and so on. Um, th those things are absolutely essential for um, the worldwide uh, supply chain of open source software. And in general, uh, I think, you know, the, the, the key thought is, and I just mentioned this a few minutes before, is the process and liability obligations need to be placed on the parties that are making the money. Um, and I think that fundamentally that I think that's clear to everybody. Um, I think that there's there was even an attempt to try to get to that point in, in the recital that was included, um, but we're concerned that it's it's not clear enough, um, and we're hoping that um, we can we can get the legislation modified to to to, to clarify this point. So what can you do? Um, so the first thing is a is a call out to our friends at Open Forum Europe that have been um, holding uh, a number of discussions. Uh, there, uh, so you can join the conversation uh, via the, the link there, um, and the, there's archives there, of course, as well. It's a very active group. Um, they just uh, yesterday arranged for uh, help arrange the meeting where um, Mikhail Barbro from the Eclipse Foundation, but you know, lots of other people went and met, met with a number of members of European Parliament and representatives on the, the Council of Europe, and and um, and so expressed our concerns and got a warm and positive reception. And so I think that's a, the very, that's a great beginning to this process. Um, but we need, uh, we need all hands on deck. Um, so to be clear, based on what we see um, in terms of the process, um, we have until somewhere in May um, to uh, effect change. Um, through uh, effectively lobbying um, members of European Parliament and, and members of the of the um, Council of Europe um, to amend the legislation um, to make sure that open source is, is properly carved out from 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 its terms. And so, public statements. Um, you know, there's some large companies on this call that that are European based um, that that whose opinions matter. Um, so, public statements to the effect that open source is critical to the future prosperity and digital sovereignty of Europe, I think um, would be very important. And engage directly with the European Parliament and, and the Council of, of Europe, of the EU. Um, 
and so we've I've, I've had a number of conversations with uh you know uh mem uh government relations people from member companies uh and one of the things i've really come to understand is the the people that are representing businesses um in in brussels uh actually typically don't understand that open source is critical to their business uh and so i think that that's uh, an education that needs to happen, uh, not just for this time, but on, on an ongoing basis to make sure that that people recognize that the people that are representing business in, in Brussels understand that that open source is an, is an integral and, an, and strategic part of the business uh, in Europe. Uh, and, and make sure that this is you reach out to your public affairs and public policy departments to, to ensure this is understood and, and communicated. So with that, uh, just one last slide with some links for anybody who's interested um, on some further reading, um, if you're if you're interested. And with that, I will say thank you, and hopefully we have some questions to discuss. Amazing. Yes, 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 indeed we do. Um, so just thank you for that excellent presentation today, Mike. And um, we do have two little questions here. The first is from uh, Michael uh, Schneider. Uh, what might be the impact of Eclipse Automotive Projects? Well, I think I, I hope I covered that in the in the uh, in the present in the presentation. Um, so basically everything that we just talked about and i specifically <laughs> mentioned uh lita um as one project that um would we i'm pretty sure would fall under the definition of highly critical product with digital elements um so with with our current interpretation of the legislation um every time lita wanted to do a release we would have to go out and get an external auditor um, to make sure that we were in compliance with the requirements of the cra and and affix the the CE mark to the uh, to the to the release distribution. So um, you know, and similar work would have to happen across all projects, including the automotive ones. Okay, perfect. Another question here: How can we CE mark a software when it is non physical medium? Good question. Um, I think the answer would be somewhere in your release distribution, uh, maybe in, the, in, in our context on, on the web page that, that you're downloading it from, but then also in a um, uh, in a notice file. Um, I'm you know I'm not exactly sure, uh, but that's uh, I'm I, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure there is some solution. Um, I I do know you know I I, I will sort of as an editorial comment, note that traditionally a CE mark has been used on things which have a physical attribute. Um, sort of, And so putting it on a completely intangible product, product um, to my knowledge, this is a first. Um, but as I, I imagine this is something that um, both we, um, industry uh, and, the com and the commission will work their way through and come up with a solution for. Okay, great. Another question here. So what are the implications on old versions of products, which would typically still be available for download from an open source project website and not removed, but may and likely will contain vulnerabilities? Um, so that's the first part of the question. So, so the short answer is I'm not sure yet. Um, I think so. We have a we at the Clips Foundation have a security vulnerability reporting um, policy already in place. That we currently follow so i think we would continue to follow that that policy um with regard to to any such project um but it is it is uh i don't think we would ever go back and affix the ce mark um because you know i, I don't think i haven't seen anything noticed anything in the legislation that says that you have to go back in time I think the timing is something along the lines of this legislation is expected to be passed in you know call it you know, late 2003, there's 2020, 2023. Um, and then I think there's one, there's a one, one year before implementation. So then we're into like late 2024. Um, and then I think that there's, um, uh, so there'll be some opportunities to figure that out in the meantime. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that, the, that there's a requirement to go back and, and apply this process to things which shipped before the act comes into effect. Okay. 
And then the second part of the question is, will the fact that a newer version is available be acceptable as far as maintenance obligations are concerned? I think so. Um, and so it's possible that, for example, um, that many of the ways that you can address the requirements of uh, of the pro the process requirements is, you know, rather than um, necessarily dealing with you know, vulnerabilities on an, on a one off basis, if you're a project that that is always constantly refreshing, um, you include it in the next refresh um, and. I think the one of the biggest changes to the Eclipse Foundation is up until now we've avoided uh, call home functionality, um, and th that is a requirement in the CRA because it's it's you need to be able to instruct users to come and get the new update with the security fixes in it. Uh, right now we don't, other than you know social media and document and our website and so on, we don't really have a a, a full-fledged ability to do that um, mm -hmm. and so that's something that we would um, need to uh, need to add um, but yeah so I think that's th there's a lot of work and discovery still to happen uh, with these things uh, so I think there, and I, as I said earlier I think there's there's going to be some time uh, to figure out how to go about um, you know properly implementing these processes in in conjunction with the Eclipse development process and uh, the way that we do releases and so on at Eclipse. Okay. And uh, so for the last question from John Kellerman, do we know when these changes in whatever final form they take are proposed or anticipated to take effect? So again, my understanding- And uh, Mike is just, uh, uh, yeah, he just said, <laughs> Mike just answered. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's amendments between now and May. Then it goes into the, the into the dialogue between the council and the parliament. Then there's a trilogue with the commission. Then there's a final thing. Then it's passed, and it's 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 expected to pass late this year. And then, as I understand it, um, a one year um, uh, period before it comes uh, because it before it comes fully into effect. Okay, great. Well, it looks like there's no more questions. Well, um, Stephen oh. Walter said there was a question that was voted up, so changed or oh, let's let's see here. Let's see here. Where actually? Oh, uh, uh, if if there is a broad exclusion of open source and all the burden is put on downstream, would wouldn't that risk that there is less incentive to um, contribute upstream? Ah, Cornelius, good question. Actually, I think the opposite. Um, so what I'm thinking, so just, just in the same way that collaborative development of open source components is, um, is um, a much cheaper and more effective way to develop software, you know, we think that there's at least the opportunity, you know, the future is opaque, but there's a good opportunity, I think, that... Um, if there, if the CRA goes through and and it it, it carves it out the way I want it carved out, but uh, all of the downstream consumers have to comply, it would make good sense to collaborate at foundations um, to do a lot of the work around CRA conformance and compliance at in the open source project itself. Um, and so I actually think that there's a good chance that if the burden is properly put on the people who are making the money, they will realize that it is far more cost effective for them to share the burden of doing that in the upstream projects. Um, so that's that's my hope. Um, and uh, hopefully that answers your question. I, that's when I, that that's what I think, um, that's what I'm hoping will happen. Okay. And I don't, I think because of this just got voted up as well. I had two there, but it says, do you have exchanges with other open source foundations or associations? Uh, yes. So first of all, through our, my colleague, Deborah Bryant, we're represented on the open SSF public policy committee. Um, so we're active there. We're very active in open forum Europe, which um, a, a ton of people are participating in. Um, we're having discussions with folks at the you know, other places in the Linux Foundation, Apache Software Foundation, 
yeah, so we're we're definitely, um, uh, you know, we are definitely working with our peers and colleagues in the broader open source community to raise awareness about how we see this um, and to um, solicit support for, uh, for, like I said, an all hands on deck kind of approach to mm -hmm. raise awareness of the problems, the way the legislation is currently drafted. Okay, great. And Deborah did provide a little bit more insight as well on answering that question. Um, so that's, that's great. Yeah, so that is it for questions, Mike. Thank you so much for taking the time today um, in, in our presentation. It's greatly appreciated. If there's anybody that has any feedback, feel free um, to provide it uh, by just clicking on the little green button once we close this off. But yes, thank you so much and take care, everyone. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm really happy we didn't use the full 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we had a great, great, great 124 uh, attendees uh, today. So thank you everyone for taking the time. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Take care.